a uh, school where until the 80s they had segregated uh, prom and always affirmed at school. It wasn't always affirmed when we went into the city. But at home in our community, when we were volunteering, the books we saw, the images we saw, the people around us affirmed who we are. There was no greater than or less than. We were just us. And we had mm. a history and we had a future. And so it was just, it was a sort of everyday history, if you will. Right. Okay. Very good. I, 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 I don't know how I actually became very interested. I think that my, my interest would peak when I was probably in, in, uh, in, in college and I had a, I had one professor, white history professor that actually told both sides of the story. And that's oh, the first nice. time I, that's the first time I ever heard history from both sides of the story. And yeah. what really piqued my interest, <coughs> Robin, he was talking about Andrew Jackson. Okay. He told all the good things <laughs> that they claim about Andrew Jackson, but on the flip mm -hmm. side of it, he told all the bad things about Andrew Jackson. All the mutilations the, and the yeah, killing. Yes. Exactly yeah. right. And 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 mm -hmm. I learned then not to like Andrew Jackson after he told both sides of the story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, but but, but, but at least you made you made an informed decision, decision right? <laughs> right. I made an informed decision yeah. before I love yeah. before I love Andrew Jackson. Before I learned mm -hmm. the real truth, you, you know what I always say is in in history is the same way. In our history, it is always three sides to a story: your side, my side, mm -hmm. and the truth. And if we, right. hear, if we hear both sides. And we're gonna come to our own truths about it, but at least you got you got two sides of the story that you can hear. You can hear the good side and the bad side, and you decide what you like in it. And that's what the way history is. And I think what happened in American history that we are only hearing the good side of American history. We don't we're not hearing the bad side of American history, and then we're not hearing most of the black history the black contribution how how black folks contributed so some of it was stolen some of it was strayed and some of it just om om omitted all together and so it and i'm glad college e. woodson had the foresight enough to at least start bringing it based to our our attention uh Robin. i think on, was it saturday you were you were going down the list of um african-american accomplishments and inventors and inventions yeah. And, and so I think what we have to do is, is weave that into our everyday life. And right. so, so even, I remember having an opportunity to visit um, with, um, oh Lord, I just forgot his name, Lord have mercy, Frederick Douglass's house in, right. in Maryland. I think it was the last house that he lived in before he, he passed and is part of the National Park Service now. And it's a beautiful house, um, multiple stories up on a hill that's absolutely gorgeous and in it he has these inventions in there things that they were using for, and some that he helped to 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 progress along um that that he used and i think one of your points is that it was the um a lot of these things happened because they were necessary right. so where you see somebody who had an iron I think you mentioned that or an ironing board. Right. It was this necessity that 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 made this invention happen. And so that to me was the 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 beautiful thing that you had this necessity and then what is necessity is the mother of invention. And that <laughs> yeah. and that these, yeah, so that so that our foreparents did this and didn't think, well, I want to what's the word? That I want to capitalize, that I want to hold it in then I want to share it. And so we did not often get some of those patents because we thought it was just a necessity. And then we were doing it and perhaps other people got, got the patents. Um, it, it doesn't decrease the fact that we did this and that we contributed and contributed mightily to it does not take away from anybody else's contributions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the, the argument is that if I say something about what I've done, that it lessens what you've done and this world and especially my God is big enough to to encapsulate all of it. There is there is no big I and little you in inventions, although you may see someone's name on there on, on one person. You can bet it was a team effort. And right. so 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 it is 
because I love my African American history unabashedly, unashamedly, proudly. It does not mean that I do not like your Lithuanian history or your uh, Spanish history or your um, um, Native American history. It means that I love mine so much that I'm big enough to invite you to love yours too. But I want to make sure that I share mine as as well. Absolutely, absolutely, and, and that's the beauty of of uh, learning about history and then learning about all facets of history. I, I was looking last night, uh, which is a fact I never knew. You know, you know who the first black man in space? Oh, I, I can see his name. He's had the short fro. <laughs> <laughs> Oh was my it, God! I can see his. Is, he, oh, is, oh my Lord! Is, I can was see it guy in blue? Buford was it Buford? Buford, that's it. Yeah. Yes, Guy Buford. Thank you. Had the short fro. Yes, <laughs> you know well, my that, sister. Yeah. Well, the, the matter of fact, he was not the first. He was not. Man. He was not the first black man in space, Robin. The first black okay. man in space was actually a Cuban. Okay, a black Cuban. That the that that went up in space three years before Americans. Guy Buford. No, right, Guy Buford. Before Guy Buford went up wow. in space. Wow. Uh, it the uh, Russia. You know when, when the United States and Russia was having a space race and uh, what That's Russia right. what right. Russia did as opposed to what what the United States did. Russia involved all of its ally countries in its in the space race. And when, of course, Cuba was one of his allies. And they, got, right. and they right. got one of the Cuban pilots, which happened to be, bl- happened to be black, a black Cuban, mm. okay? Mm-hmm. And, they, and they trained him to be a cosmonaut, okay? And uh, oh, so, yes, yeah, so he actually in 1980, during 1980, he went up in space, being the very first <laughs> black person to go up in space. <gasps> Three years later, then Guy Bluford went up in 1983. So, but those are the kinds oh of facts God. that those are the kinds of facts that we don't know about sometimes. And, and you know, of course, the United States of America downplayed it. Okay, they didn't. They didn't. They didn't. They didn't want to make that um, a, a big issue out of it because number one. Uh, at that time, Russia was kind of beating their, beating our butts in, in space, mm-hmm. and uh, so and, and number two, uh, they didn't want to make it. They don't want to bring attention to the to the, the race issues that we had here. So it got very little airplay uh, in the United States. I can't. I think I can't think of the guy's name. He obviously one of these Cuban names that I can't hardly pronounce. But but uh, but he was a black Cuban. But the very first black man that flew into space. I, I'm, that that is so fascinating. Thank you for sharing that because I always yeah. thought it was guy uh, was it Buford or Bluford. I, I just yeah. you know always thought, especially looking at his fro. But then that 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 brings to mind, um, and I'm not a baseball his, historian, but I remember yeah. reading. I think I was doing some early work on um, on uh, 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 the early African American baseball, and we were looking at the 1955 uh, team here, looking mm-hmm. at some early African American baseball. And one of the things that happened is because of the the discrimination um, when when African Americans would play, and I think this happened particularly in I want to say New Jersey. It may have been New York or Pennsylvania, but I think I'm pretty sure it was New Jersey that. They said that they, these were African American players because of the discrimination issue, and when whites didn't want to play against black, and it may have been at the administrative level or you know certainly a cultural thing, mm-hmm. a society thing, they would say that they were Cubans. So they were fully <laughs> African Americans, but you would say that they were Cubans, and so they're just putting on the uniform and and then told they were told not to speak. So don't speak because if you speak, you'll give away your American accent <laughs> instead of your Cuban accent. So and I and I'm not sure if they changed their names or, or not. I don't have that fact in front of me. But this is like in the 1800s, and so so you would see that that sort of mindset change. Like people wanted to, you know, skill has nothing to do with color, right? So right. so so any of us are capable of doing anything. It may be at different levels. You're obviously. 
a, a, a stellar broadcaster and I can say, well, I can spell broadcast, right? So, so each of us have the ability to do things. Mm -hmm. but, but, but because of this color line, as Booker T would say, because of this color line, they may, they, and, and these black folks, these black players wanted to play. And so they just said, okay, you can play, but you're going to be Cuban. You're gonna be, <laughs> and you ain't going to talk. <laughs> you're going to be Cuban. <laughs> hey, Robin, um, one of the things I, I got here on, on your name, I, I, your last name, I got an S. Is this a C. Rashad? Or spell that again. Let's try to make sure I get your name correct. Sure, it's R E S H A R D. R E E R E S. I had it right then. R E S H A R D. A R D. That's right. right. Okay, I had it right. I, you know, when I was looking at it, when you was talking, I got your name captured there, and I said, "Well, should I have, that S should have been a C, or should it have been an S?" <laughs> Okay. So, so it's, it's a real quick fun. Speaking of uh, changing things, so so Lloyd's family, my husband's family name, I think it was at his grandfather's level, was changed. The original spelling was R I C H A R D. So it's the French uh, oh. spelling, and and just you know David Richard, David and Ann Richard. Yeah, 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 yeah. David is Lloyd's second cousin, so they really? share grandfathers. Their grandfathers were brothers. Wow. But but they kept pronouncing their name Richard at uh, school instead of Richard. So mm -hmm. I, I don't remember if it was a teacher or who at the school actually changed the spelling of their name. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah. So the original spelling was the original, the French R-I-C-H-A-R-D. Okay. Now we was talking about a little known black history, you know, just like you was talking about the, the, uh, the baseball team and, 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 and and making them being Cuban and and the necessity is the mother and in invention and and I, and I truly believe that because you know black folks we are the ones that having to do the the, the actual hard work and I, and I was just teasing on the radio the other day when I was going through those lists of facts like the lady with the ironing board you know and I know they had her just a square old board but but she had to figure out a way to, to slide those clothes on there. So then she figured it out. Okay. Oh, and, wow. Yeah. And, and, and the golf tee. Okay. Now, guess who was the caddies? Black folks, right? Yes. And I can bet you, and you probably can't see my hand, but I can bet you if, that they had to put the hands down there <laughs> to hold oh, that ball. And, and hold the ball. And wow. hold the ball. And so, and, and you know, don't, you know, you know, joke about, the ant, right? And getting on the ball, you heard that, that joke? No. <laughs> that there's um they out there golfing, right? And uh -huh. the man and the man hit everything, ants ant holes and everything, ants went everywhere. And then one ant looked at the other ant and say, If we wanna survive, we better get on the ball. Get on top of the ball. That's how that that's because he hitting everything but the, he hitting everything but the ball. <laughs> so, you didn't tell Walter Wallace and Par for them that, huh? You told that joke to him. <laughs> no, but I will tell Walter that. Get it, Adrian. Adrian Steele. Yeah, we're gonna get in, get in trouble. Lord have mercy. Yeah. David, so, David, all of we're gonna get in trouble. But but I imagine because the black man invented the, the tea. For that, for that, uh, for, for wow. God. So I imagine that was a. Re I, I don't know this for a fact, but I imagine that they had to put the hands down there to set the ball on top and make them close, do a close fist and put the hand down there and hit the ball. And so wow. I guess I guess they got tired of the hands getting hit, so they invented the golf tee. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> they should have called it an ant, huh? Let's hit this yeah. ant. Put that ant down there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> yeah, and our, our history is absolutely beautiful. It is um, it is diverse. Even within the African-American community, you had different, uh, different ideas, different, as you talked about, inventions, different lanes that people chose to go in, different opportunities they chose to take, um, different ways they, they chose to, to go. And so, you know, so, so I think that's the beautiful thing about uncovering all of this. So, yeah. um, uh, you know, and I think there's so much diversity within our culture that it, 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 it is a shame to not celebrate all of it, to not think of it as a sort of one, one size fits all 
a culture or 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 history it's like um european history or african history or mm -hmm. australian history pick a continent right south american mm -hmm. history when you go you can you can take a thirty thousand foot view but as you start coming down is so let's talk about africa as you start coming down then you go okay there's egyptian history there's right. liberian history there's a uh, congo history congolese history uh so many different south american history there's so a uh, south african history there's so many different um countries and then as you go there then you go into the different um areas into the to the different regions and then you go down and you go into the different uh uh, uh neighborhoods or tribes or cities so 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 the mountainous areas just like right. you know for for us we have rural we have uh -huh. urban um uh, we have suburban it's a, it's the same way everywhere and so so, so, so our, our history is absolutely amazing. And because again, because I celebrate my history, whether it's my great, great grandmother's Liberian history or, or my, uh, Arkansas history does not decrease your burnt corn. Uh, you know, I had to bring that up. Does not <laughs> decrease your burnt <laughs> corn history. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't take anything away from it. It should invite you to celebrate yours and to ask, what in my history am I missing? What have in my history is is not there? And D.L. Hughley, he was um, hosting the uh, filling in as a host on the Daily Show. Uh, I think it was last week, and he said something that was so powerful. Um, and I cannot remember who who his guest was, but he said he said it used it was a time when as enslaved people couldn't learn, mm -hmm. and now we are, we cannot learn about enslaved people. Mm. But that is absolutely powerful. There was a time mm. when enslaved people couldn't learn and now right. you can't even learn about enslaved people. Ain't and so, something? you know, he was making the point that there are people who were trying to, whether they're politicians or whether they're historians or whether they're um, public figures or, or whether uh, they're teachers uh, and, and perhaps even some of your neighbors don't want you to share in all of that. And, and, and in that, it's the good, the bad, and the ugly. So it's, it's this thing, especially when you talk about enslaved people, well, they say, well, you know, well, uh, most of the masters, uh, the enslavers treated their, 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 their people good. Well, that does not hurt. I mean, that does not uh, uh, solve, uh, put any salve on my wound. That right. does, you know, it's a, this is a, slavery was a hurting thing and, and you cannot, um, you can't make it easy. You can't make it easy. It was a terrible time in our history. It went on. It was a, a positive interaction for a lot of people uh, who made money off of other people. You you can't denounce. You can't den you, you can't forget that 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 right. slavery was an economic engine, and exactly. so it was an economic engine. It was a cultural engine. It it became a society engine, and now it is this historical fact that people want us to forget. It is not all of our history, but in America, it is a huge part of our history that, that we won't, we don't want to deal with. Malcolm X said something that was talk about the healing. He said, if you stick a knife in my back, I'm going to get the inches wrong, but you'll get the point. Yeah. So if you stick a knife in my back, nine inches and you take it out three, that's not progress. Right. You got to take that knife all the way out right. because that's when the healing can truly begin. It's going right. to hurt coming out. Just right. like I dare say it hurt going in, it's going to hurt coming out. Right. But the healing cannot truly begin until you take that knife out. Absolutely. And so I think we need a little bit more. Our, our public officials, our politicians, our teachers, our historians, we need a little bit more um, uh, sympathy and empathy and, and righteousness when we're talking about history. And don't just say, you know, black people did everything great. And don't just say white people did everything great. There are so many yeah. gradations in there yeah. that we need to explore and that deserve to be shared, explored. Share the whole story. You're right. You know, Robin, That's right. I, good, the good, the bad, and the ugly. ugly. Yeah. I had a teacher one time. She was talking about, not necessarily about history in general, but she was talking about knowledge. She, not, she wasn't talking about history specifically, but she was talking about knowledge in general. She's saying that what you know, share what you know and, yeah. and that a lot of folks have a not have a issue of sharing what they know 
because they want to be, and only use your metaphor as a knife, they, because they want to be the sharpest knife in the drawer, yeah. okay? But if they don't, what they don't fully understand about knowledge is that you can share knowledge all day long. It's not, it's not like water in a bottle that when I pull yeah. some of it out, I'm going to lose some of it. You're never going to lose it. It's more like a, a copy machine. When I when I share my knowledge with you, it's going to multiply. It's another sheet, right. print, That's another right. sheet, another sheet, then everybody is is on it. But but some people don't see it that way. And so if we were to share our history, you're talking about Grio. In fact, talking about this channel, my, my channel, I have the Greek, what they call the Grio Network from Byron yeah. Allen. And, and, and I know you know well what the Grios are, okay? And yeah. I, think, I yeah. think you can probably tell the, why the, the story of the Grio is better than I. So I want to let you tell the folks about the Grio and, and why is the Grio important to us. Well, the, the, the griots in, in African, uh, both folklore and practice, were those people, um, uh, men and women and, and often children, who carried the, our history forward. And they did that in a number of different, right, a number of different ways. There's an oral tradition, yeah. storytelling. There's a visual tradition, uh, art, um, dancing, performance. And there's a written tradition of, um, you know, the, the hieroglyphics and passing those things along yeah. in the in the written word. So when the word came out of whichever African country and went over to uh, the Greeks and then the Greeks carried it, it, it on, that was mm -hmm. that was that written tradition. But those those griots were looked at as the uh, the the keepers of the lore, if you will, the keepers of the stories, the keepers of the culture. But they didn't they didn't they kept it, but they kept it moving. And that's the important thing about being a griot is that you have to keep it moving. We're only going to be here from point A to, to point Z. Right. And there's a lot of in between there. But our time here on this plane is 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 limited. So how can you make good for what your purpose is and then carry it? Make sure that the next generation, when that Z comes around and it's time to hand it off to another A, when it's time for me to hand off that tradition, then I need to be able to uh, to open myself up. I should be doing it all along the way, right? I should be able to open myself up and, and share that. So whether it's through art, whether it's through dance, uh, whether it's through storytelling, whether it's through invention, uh, I should be able to uh, be big and bad and bold enough to <laughs> share myself with that. And that's what these African uh, storytellers did. And I mean storytellers in a whole bunch of different ways. It could have been that invention, you know, um, that's what they did. And we have these things today because they shared them uh, 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 along. And I mean, think of the story of Byron Allen, this multimedia, right. um, uh, I, don't, I don't know if he's a billionaire, but I think if he ain't, he, he is. He is. He is. He is. <laughs> a as, as I understand it, he is, uh, you know. But yeah, and so I mean, think about it. Even when he bought the Weather Channel, I mean, right. he's like, what? Like, why are you doing? I mean, he, he, his, his tentacles go in so many different directions, and that's that diversity in making sure that these stories are continue to be told. So how weather decimates community. So he mm -hmm. want he wanted to make sure that that story is told in so many different ways. Uh, his uh, we know him early as entertainment, but he's diversified and so so he is this entertainment griot if you if you will certainly a business griot right um so yeah so i i get why he why why he is you know it, why he called it, it that because you know we're standing on some shoulders of people that we don't even know i mean people in a whole on a whole different continent that that we don't even know um people who sacrificed themselves to make sure that we could have something generations later uh, those Absolutely. those griots are so important, and they continue today. I think of Polian, uh, you know, drumming and, and yeah. per, the percussion. Um, uh, Naila Black Spears, who's I think in Central Florida now, dancing. Or Fern Gillibo, uh, Eleanor Johnson, dancing. Um, uh, uh, the uh, Georgia Blackman with her with her bookstore now. Nicole uh, Dixon, Dixon um, yeah. and Kanita Kanita with their bookstores. You know how they're standing on shoulders of of people who kept the written word you know so so we can't do it we're not in this by ourselves so you holding it to you holding it close to you does nothing except for let it die on the vine so that's, that's the, true that's the only way we can do this is by sharing it 
Yes, that is so true. Uh, Robin, you know, we, we talk a lot about history in general, but you know, Pensacola has a very rich history uh, in, the, in the black community. And many times uh, the, the stories are not told that we got some very rich uh, history that we need to talk about. And, and, and I'm doing this as a series because I'm going to talk to you and I'm going to and I'll talk to Dr. Williams as well about yeah. his knowledge. I'm going to talk to um, uh, my other man down at uh, down at um, St. Joseph, um, come on now, help me out with his name. Oh, um, uh, the, Martin, uh, Lawrence, yeah. Martin Lewis. No, Martin Lewis. You know Martin, Martin Lewis. Yes, Lord, Martin, Martin Lewis. Lewis. Is a, Lewis. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. I want to talk to him about some, some local black history. I mean, it's so much rich history in Pensacola as it relates to black folks that hasn't been told. Okay? Hasn't yeah. been told. Now, you are the one of the very few people that I know have been Get, you, you the, you the, uh, the black. What's the, what's the white guy name? Apple Yard. You the black Apple Yard. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Dick Dick Apple Yard. He tells the story. You know, he's getting credit for telling the story of of the local black. Oh, John Apple Yard. John Apple Yard. Yeah, Dick is his son. Okay, John yeah, Apple Yard. Yeah, yeah. So, so you the you the black John Apple Yard. I call you. <laughs> But as as uh, somebody somebody was telling a story about John Sunday uh, to a to a group, and so uh, of uh, uh, senior uh, educators uh, in this in this education program, and uh, mm -hmm. the lady said, she said, oh, she said, well, he's uh, John talking about John Sunday. He was black. Uh -huh. He said, well, he's like the black Quinn Studer. I said, no, 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 Quinn Studer is the white John Sunday. So <laughs> I choose to <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Okay. So, so, so John Appleyard is a local historian, but I choose to believe that I have a I have a different a different uh, path, and I certainly do appreciate his that you know that 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 he sought to 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 do the work, and you know, and 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 some of that work has to be corrected because even John Appleyard, uh, you know, had a specific sphere that he was a specific lens because he grew up in a particular time well, when you know it was all right for the KKK to be. You know, to be your business partner, right. and so so <laughs> even him and we had this conversation, uh, uh, and so you know, so you do you have to make sure that the lens that you're sharing history is one that is as best as you can, because I promise you, my lens is tainted. So right. even letting people know that your lens is is tainted, because I grew up, uh, as I said earlier, when we opened around a family and a community, a church group that affirmed who are <laughs> group United Methodist and around. You know, people who affirmed who we who we were said you can do whatever you want to. You got to put the you got to put the work in. As, uh, what's his name? Senator Warnock just wrote his book and put your shoes on. You got to yep. put your shoes on. Shoes you got to do that. Said. Put the work in. Yeah. Yeah. And so I am I am standing on some amazing shoulders around here. People who uh, Georgia McCorvey uh, Smith or or Wills, people who who did this uh, work, who made sure that this work was written and and shared and and forwarded those griots Georgia McCorvey Smith she's already made her transition or wills is still with us that their that their work still lives on and mm -hmm. that's what we want to do um, uh, and even I'll I'll put this plug in we're doing a series with the Pensacola News Journal with these obituaries of people who were forgotten uh, so on Sundays two Sundays a month we're doing uh, obituaries of people who made um, uh, significant um, uh, uh, contributions or just contributions uh, to uh, Pensacola and Escambia County via their community. So whether the community was Warrington or Century or uh, Perdido or um, uh, Wedgwood. Um, uh, so wherever that downtown Pensacola, uh, the blocks, uh, wherever that was the tan yard, we are uh, we are revisiting those obituaries to give them their just written word at the end of their life. Uh, right. And that's important because often what you would see, and the one that I'm working on now is on Ezra Gary, you would see uh, Negro dies and it would be attributed to the whole race. And so 
you know, but given a name and given this proper information uh, of, about uh, Ellison Bennett hooked me up with, um, we just lost Donald Reed and Donald Reed's right. mother, Josephine Reed, uh, was, uh, she started uh, Reed Sanitation. I'm still trying to dig into when that, when that came about. We know it was there as early as the 60s, but she was the one who started that. And so you heard really? about it with Donald Reed Sr., but you want to, mm -hmm. you know, this woman who is who is starting this business. It's right. a, that's a beautiful thing, and it and it shows that the um, that not only for women, but the Warrington community has a significant history uh, for for Pensacola. And so um, I, I haven't seen her obituary yet, but I'm I'm betting it it may not have been that much because in a lot of it, what you would see, especially for women, you would see. I think her husband's name was John. You would see mm -hmm. Mrs. John Reed or Mrs. whatever the initials were Reed, uh, Reed. And so their first names would even be stripped away from them. Wow. So, so yeah, so we're just trying to continue to, to um, you know, as we find out more information, the information's already there. It's not like, so we just have to go looking for it. This information is already there. You, you, so, yeah, you, I'm just nosy. I'm nosy yeah. and curious and all of that. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned earlier, um, Robin, uh, and, and, and it might be a good way to start, uh, a guy by the name of John Sunday, okay? And, uh, in, 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 and I think in Pensacola Black History, I think that is a name that we all should be aware of. Let's start, can we start the conversation off and start talking about the significance of John Sunday and who he was? Yeah, John Sunday was born in 1838. Uh, he mm -hmm. was one of four children uh, born to uh, to uh, a white man, a German um, man who, uh, I forget which country he original came from. It may have been uh, Bulgaria or, or Germany, I'm not sure, but, but Eastern European uh, mm -hmm. came here as a, a farmer and as a, um, a mill owner on the Escambia River, uh, he was he was married uh, to a white woman. But he also uh, his uh, wife had a caretaker who was an Egyptian, uh, African uh, American uh, Egyptian mm -hmm. woman, and so uh, uh, and so um, he had four children by her, mm -hmm. uh, and and. And in the the senior, now he also had, it, it gets a little confusing because people will try to, he also had an, a white son named John Sunday too. So he had this black and white son named John Sunday and he had a white son named John Sunday and his name was John Sunday. <laughs> and so, yeah. And so he, um, he put in his, uh, he filed it with the court that the day after and family lore says that they were not treated as enslaved children. And, and family lore said the day after the date of his death, that his four children would be set free. Remember that this was, he was born in 1838 and, mm -hmm. and, and African-Americans by and large, uh, because we know every African-American in America was not uh, enslaved. But in mm -hmm. the South, 90% uh, of them were. And so by and large, uh, they were not treated as enslaved uh, people, at least not to his, at least not to his uh, parents, uh, to his mother and father. And so he, he was shot by uh, an enslaved man named Adam. The, and it was filed in the court records and, and what the, the thought was that his white, John Sunday's white children provided this uh, Adam with a gun to shoot them because they did not like this setup. But, but they didn't know, the white children did not, was not aware that John Sunday, that their father had filed this in the court. And so it's, it's so remember he said, the day after the date of my death, then these, my four children will go free. And so when he died in 19, uh, in, in, uh, I think 1838 or 1839, mm -hmm. John Sunday and his siblings were supposed to be set free. They were supposed to be free Americans with this full 
right of, uh, you know, that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as, as the Constitution and the Declaration declare. Instead, some of his relatives, uh, remember I said he was on the Escambia River, so right there, Escambia and Santa Rosa County mm -hmm. uh, joined together. Uh, you could walk across it uh, up in the Molino area. Uh, and so he, uh, in that area of Santa Rosa, I'm, I'm, I can't remember, it was on the Molino side. So he, he, so they tried to sell them into, back into slavery. So, and they put an ad in the paper to sell these, that they had these four slaves to sell. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so, so a friend of John Sunday's said, wait a minute. We in he has filed this in the court. Remember, the other children did not know this, right. and so he had filed this in the court. And so, um, so it was challenged in the court. People can look at their public records. There, mm -hmm. he was challenged in the court, and so they were set free. They were given their their uh, freedom papers. Uh, him and his four siblings were given their freedom papers, mm -hmm. and so he went on to uh, to become. Um, a uh um he went on to what's called indenture himself to learn uh um uh what do you call it when you're carpentry uh mm -hmm. casket building they would build the vaults uh for uh saint michael's and other cemeteries so he went on to indenture himself he got paid half of what a white man would get paid but he went on to indenture himself so that he could have uh work and he did this and then he went on to um to, uh, he enlisted in the Civil War in the 25th uh, Infantry, Company K in the 25th Infantry, uh, mm -hmm. what they call the U.S. Colored Troops, USCT. His <laughs> name is on the um, memorial in Washington, D.C., and I've seen that it's a, it's a beautiful thing to see his name, his name and others here from Pensacola, but I'm mm -hmm. specifically looking for his name. It's a beautiful monument there, the African American Civil War veterans. And so, he he uh, he left uh, Pensacola during the Civil War. Ended up in Louisiana. Met a woman uh, named Seraphine in Louisiana. Married her and returned here. She had a son prior to. He adopted uh, that son, and they came back and subsequently had, I believe, either nine or ten children. Um, and uh, so he he began to grow his his businesses, and so he began to. Uh, build. He was a, a, a builder. He bought real estate um, and he included his children. He had either uh, eight or nine sons and one daughter. And he included his children in on these um, on these real estate deals. So in the again, public records, you would see him uh, buying land. He would buy often buy whole blocks. You would see him doing this. And then as a witness, you would see the, a child, one of his children witness uh, him. People know uh, Dr. Yeah. Edward Sunday, uh, both Dr. Edward Sundays. They yeah. knew uh, that's that's his father and grandfather. He had three sons who were physicians, one uh, son-in-law who was a a dentist, and all of them were involved in 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 this, you know, in real estate buying and selling mm -hmm. uh, uh, real estate. Um, and so so. Um, so, so you saw this very, very impactful man, African American. Um, in fact, in 1906, when the book came out, the uh, Negro uh, Negro in Business, uh, written or compiled by Booker T. Washington, um, I think our local author would have been Matthew Louie, who was the publisher and the owner of the um, Florida Sentinel. Uh, he was friends, as was uh, John. Uh, um, uh, you know, what do you call them? Peers uh, with um, Booker T. Washington. So that book by Booker T. Washington, Negro in Business, they mentioned John Sunday as the richest African-American uh, uh, here and talk about his, his taxes and the amount of taxes mm -hmm. that he pays. Because again, he had land. Uh, and when I trace his real estate transactions, and I am not a real estate uh, person, a real estate uh, researcher, so even in this very amateur way, I was able to see up to 80 real estate transactions. And again, he bought uh, lots and blocks and parcels. It was absolutely amazing. And one of the other things, talking about community that he did, I'll say this in hush, mm -hmm. one of the other things that he did 
was when he saw some, when someone was in trouble, let's say that you bought a house and, and couldn't uh, contend with your mortgage, he would buy that property and allow the family to stay there and pay that mortgage to them, make some uh, um, amends and, and pay that mortgage to them. So very, very community uh, minded. Well, Robin, what, didn't he build that house on Romano Street and 302, is it West Romano? I think it's West Romano Street. And, That's but I right. Think, but they, it's torn down now, right? It, they That's right. It was, that, that was the last house that he lived in. Uh -huh. um, and that it was right there at the uh, corner, the uh, that would be the northwest corner of Rue and uh, Romano Street. And a lot of his property was on Romano Street. Some of the right. other houses further down on Romano Street are still mm -hmm. standing that he uh, that that he bought. And so, yes, that was the last house um, that he uh, that he lived in uh, but prior to his death in 1925. The interesting thing we talk about Martin DePores Lewis uh, and that, you know, as a fabulous historian, uh, especially about the, the, the Catholics here in Pensacola, uh, John Sunday's sister, uh, Amanda Mercedes uh, Sunday Ruby, uh, convinced John Sunday, he owned the land where St. Joseph uh, stays right now today. Mm -hmm. And his sister convinced him he was going to build his house there. His sister convinced him to donate the, uh, to, to wanted him to donate the land, but he ended up selling the land to the Catholic church. And I think it was for $3,000. Mm -hmm. And then he donated the money back to the Catholic church. It was a diocese. I think it was Pensacola mobile. And so he yeah, ended yeah. up uh, uh, doing that, but his sister convinced him to do that because at the time, the most of the black uh, Catholics, black Creole, uh, they had different names, mulatto, Negro color, mm -hmm. went to uh, with whites to St. Michael's right? and it was segregated. And so it was such a growth that, that they, I cannot remember the sister's name who uh, asked for that, but Amanda Mercedes, uh, she goes by Mercedes Ruby, that's John Sunday's sister is the one who uh, asked him and convinced him to uh, to to do that. So that house uh, faces the the water and faces uh, St. Joseph there. So it's a little bit of little bit of tie in there in that that history. Very good. That, see, that's a lot mm -hmm. of rich history that a lot of folks don't know about uh, yeah. about local Pensacola. Continue. With the yeah. Local so history. so let me just. But, the 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 one the the neat thing you know i love the blocks right that's why i yeah. had my first cup of gumbo <laughs> was that the door? i had a lot was of that couple, i had a lot of first at the on the blocks <laughs> well I, I, you know i want to hear that you know i want to hear that uh the first uh land transaction oh, well, hold, that, on, hold on a minute Robert, hold on a minute hold on a minute okay the, 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 my first uh, a good chicken sandwich came from the blocks. Uh, oh. When when I came, uh, let me. I'm gonna tell you because a quick story. Now we'll get back to history. Okay, okay. tell you a quick story. Okay, okay. now you know I, I, you could you probably came, you come from Arkansas. I don't know where you came from the country. You was a city girl in Arkansas. Oh no, I was country straight You're up. Country straight girl. up. Okay. Well, you know natural steps. <laughs> you know that in the country, you know when we ate chicken, you know it was with a meal. It was with rice and collard greens and all that kind That's of stuff. Right. We never eat. You had to have rice. We never had a, a chicken sandwich per se. We never. When, when I when I got to Pensacola, when I heard the churches, oh, wow. when I heard the churches chicken, just people just eating chicken by itself, just chicken and bread. You know, hell, I I thought if you're gonna eat chicken, you need to eat it with cake. <laughs> but, <laughs> but pound, anyway, pound cake, pound, pound cake, get it right, pound cake. <laughs> Exactly right, <laughs> but but uh, but but church was one of my first experiment with eating chicken by itself. But but let me go back to my point about the blocks. Okay, my to, to eat chicken in a sandwich in a sandwich mm. between between bread was light only, bread, light bread, light, light bread, <laughs> white, yeah, light bread, light bread, and it wasn't white bread. It was light bread, was light and, bread. Uh, but my first experience eating chicken, a chicken sandwich, was on the block. I got many foreign memories of the block, and and um, 
And I tell, and, I, uh, and on my radio show, I talk a lot about Lone Tall Sally and how he used to DJ it uh, down on the blocks and stuff. And I have a lot of stories about that. But I, I'm not going to bore that. I want to get back to the re real history. When, but when you said the block, it, you know, it's, it started bringing bring oh, yeah. back memories to me. But, but go ahead. Well, with I, I never had gumbo <laughs> before. And so, really? I, you know, I pull up, I had never grew up in Arkansas. You know, rice is, is, was one of our, is, uh, still continues to this day, uh, one uh -huh. of our number one experts. Sports and so uh, uh, people think Louisiana, but Arkansas. That Southern rice and rice is out of Arkansas, yeah, and hey, so uh, speaking that speaking. was you know rice breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But to have this gumbo, I had never, I never had it. You know, so we may have neck bones too. I never heard of gumbo, and so it was my first one. And then to put the, uh, it was a little green because I understand whoever made it I ain't gonna blame it on Khrushchev, but whoever made it put, a, <laughs> put some extra. Put some put some extra fillet in there, and it yeah. was green. Man, that was the best stuff. I had never had gumbo before. Yeah. Wow. You know, you're speaking yeah. of. You, you we're talking about Black History again, okay? Yeah. You're speaking of, of rice, and you saying you, everybody think rice came from China, okay? A lot of it is from the Southeast Asian area, but what the little known Black History fact is that Black folks might not own it, but they grew. A lot of rice in, in Arkansas and also in the Delta of Mississippi. And in fact, that's, right. that's where Uncle Ben's rice uh, formed that, in, in the Delta of Mississippi. Well, it came from that West African uh, area. So even when you, you know, when the, when they, when Africans were brought here and going down to South America and coming up through the Caribbean and, or yeah. even brought over and to the, to the States in that South Carolina area, that's why South Carolina was, uh, did so well with their rice fields because right. they had these Africans of, of in the West African countries had all of this, uh, uh, you know, experience. And so, so yeah, but that Delta region, that, that rich, uh, they call it the black belt yeah. and not because of the color of folks skin, but because of because that rich, rich soil, soil. Uh, right. that could, I mean, you plant something, it's, it's going to grow. And so, uh, so they're having some issues with monocultures right now, but you know, by and large that, that rice and, and corn uh, to some degree, but rice was 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 it. Even when I go home now, <laughs> I go back home now. You you ride by those rice fields, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. When I, when I go when I go home in the in the fall of the year, I ride I ride by those cotton fields. And I get the twitching. Uh, <laughs> don't twitch. Don't twitch. PTSD start kicking in. <laughs> No, don't twist. Don't, 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 don't twist. Don't, don't twist. Don't twist. Okay. But John right. Sunday, the first, the first property that he bought was in uh, Belmont de Villas that, that we could trace in uh, 1869, I believe. So a little bit mm -hmm. after he came back from the civil war, um, maybe 1867, but sometime after he came back from the civil war, uh, he bought that property uh, where we now know, where the Magnolias were, Southern Oaks, and the name just escapes me. They just uh, changed names. But that nursing home, but it was uh, yeah, a few Magnolia. blocks. Yeah, few, yeah, yeah. That was the first property that he uh, that that he bought. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. Right. So that that kind of started uh, his his um, real estate portfolio, if you if you will. Yeah, absolutely yeah. amazing. And he had, you know, he bought things on what we call Railroad Street, Tarragona Street. He yeah. bought property. Um, matter of fact, four pieces of property uh, were in his family as rentals uh, for a hundred years. The family was able to use it as rentals. No, none of the family had ever lived there, but they used it as rentals right there on Romano and uh, Alconese. Yeah. And so, uh, so just up until I think the either the eighties or the nineties. Um, so yeah, so this history is absolutely amazing. And our, and we have that in each of our families, right? Um, uh, and, and sometimes it's not so pretty. One of the, yeah. um, uh, uh, I'll just mention her first name, Angela, uh, one of, uh, her ancestors, uh, she, she inherited property in Molino. And uh, it was property that was they her aunt had come from uh, the Apalachicola area, and uh, so uh, uh, after the Civil War came with the man who was and I'm going to put it in air quotes who was he said he was her servant, but they all they always traveled together. He left mm -hmm. his land to her, passed on to her niece, and then subsequently passed on to uh, to Angela. 
And so, uh, but the land, when, when, the, when uh, Angela's aunt asked for it to be plotted, uh, McDavid sent the aunt a letter saying that that land up there is so convoluted that he, he wouldn't even plot it, but she's still paying taxes on it to this day because she does not want to lose that legacy. Um, wow. and so, so even our history is sometimes, you know, you're, you're doing, you're trying to do the right thing, but you're, you're, um, having to deal with this convoluted past. Uh, right. And so people see that, and I know Fred Gant could talk about that. People see that when they talk <laughs> about uh, air property and probating things. You know, if you don't have a clear line, then sometimes it, it, it gets and people end up losing uh, land. And so mm -hmm. land is one of those large assets that, that we have, those physical assets that we have. Absolutely. So John Sunday is a a beacon of light. He's not the only one. There are certainly many others, men and women, uh, but he was a beacon of light to, um, in, in terms of real estate and what you could do to pass these, um, pass assets on to your, uh, to your family. Uh, yeah. I'll say this real quick and we can move on from John Sunday, but in his will, when he died in 1925, he, um, he 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 split up you know he left the house to his uh wife seraphine and then he split up the remains with his children and those uh i don't remember how many it was three that he that were medical doctors but one or two i think still owed him from medical school so he said you're gonna get this money but i want you to pay back this money i've lent you for, for medical school <laughs> so even even in death, he was making sure that his children understood, you know, that you that you have accountability. So he said, Absolutely. I'm going to get this money minus this, you know, X number of dollars that you that you borrow from me to go to medical school. <laughs> yeah. Hey, now, speaking of, before we get off on John Sunday, wasn't John one of John Sunday's sons or grandsons that that was the person that the green book movie was based on uh out of um new york well, I, you know what i'm talking about yeah th no that was not uh it, there was a relation but it was a relation on two different sides of the family so okay. it was not a direct uh r relation um but the um so the green book was done and i cannot remember his name his his uh he was a postal worker. And so right. when he traveled, he wanted to make sure it was it Victor. I think Victor Smith, he wanted to travel when he traveled, he wanted to make sure that he, um, that, that, that people like him, African Americans mm -hmm. knew where they could stay instead mm -hmm. of going and saying, you can't stay here or go around the back to eat. He said, these are the restaurants, the gas stations, the hotels, the retail stores, the hospitals, anything that you need, this is where you can go. It was yeah. a, if you will, a yellow pages of it. And it was, it was a, a small uh, green, green book. It was uh, absolutely amazing. And he did that for decades. Um, but the, that was based off, they, they, they added two stories in there and that was based off of Don Shirley. Sure. Yeah. That's who, what I'm thinking. Shirley. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's what Don I'm thinking. Shirley, who was a, a child prodigy. Uh, his father uh, was uh, Edwin Shirley, Reverend Edwin Shirley, who came here in the early twenties to be the pastor of St. Cyprian Episcopal church. And I think he came here in 1924, mm -hmm. um, but certainly in the early twenties, he came here. His mother, Mrs. Shirley, her first name escapes me because remember that, like I said, a lot of this early history, you would just see their names would be Mrs. E.S. Shirley. Mm -hmm. uh, but his mother was a musician, um, a piano player and taught in the right. Scambia County schools uh, as, a, as a, 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 p a music teacher. And mm -hmm. she taught uh, Don how to play. Don was born right here in Pensacola, contrary to the, to the mute, to the, um, to the movie, which was, you know, um, dramatized uh, right. about his life. So he, um, uh, his parents were Jamaican though. And right. so he, um, so he was, uh, born there and right there on live right there in Belmont de Villers. And uh, again, they were, you know, associated with St. Cyprian. And so he was a child prodigy, a piano player. And at the age of nine was invited to, uh, Russia, 
to uh, to play at the age of nine. So think about that. If you think about people like, and I'm, I don't know musicians, but um, I think Tchaikovsky is uh, uh, maybe Polish, uh, but that Eastern Eastern European, uh, they they have a um, uh, Germany and and um, uh, Poland. They they have this this history of, of you know stellar piano players uh, Wagner, and so he was invited to Russia to play this child prodigy at the age of nine and went to Russia to play. And so that story is based on him. He subsequently, he was a psychologist, uh, mm -hmm. studied in Chicago, mm -hmm. degreed in, in Chicago, and then uh, moved to, uh, he went between Chicago and New York and uh, ended up staying at Carnegie Hall. And at the time, Carnegie Hall had the, they had the theater and all of the art space, but they also had apartments above. And he stayed at right. Carnegie Hall, lived there uh, up until right. I think right before his death. Right. And so yeah. he he was traveling. Uh, he went on a tour and did not want to go south, but his record label wanted him to uh, to to come come back south. And so he he did it. And and that Green Book uh, it's uh, helped to guide them uh, to where where they could stay. It's it is told yeah and that's sort of the chagrin that it's told from the driver's perspective more so from don Shirley's right. perspective uh and so there's certainly a conversation on you know whose whose um eyes that we see history remember through. yeah we remember we said it's, it's always two sides to a story so you, no, know, you said two, three sides well, well it's three <laughs> sides but but there are two sides your side and my yes. side and then there's the truth there's three the truth. There's all of them there are three sides to a story so you right. just you just don't hear one side and you write about the story it was told from the white driver's point of view not don yeah. shirley's not don shirley's uh point of view as well uh it's so much stuff that that we can talk about talk about that that related to to, to black history and don shirley and, and that was that was that was some great information to know even about how great don shirley is and 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 which you think about black history again and and we're not going to get into this but i'm just going to mention this you were talking about he went to russia at nine years old but, yeah. but that was a move and i know you maybe you know this but i think you do that was a move early on uh that russia actually invited black there are a lot of black russians even today mm, uh, a, right. a lot of russians invited a lot of black people to come to, to live in Russia since we've been getting treated so bad over here. And so a lot of black folks actually traveled to Russia. Does having black Russians today. But continue with the other stuff. Because we can talk all day long on well, that stuff. But, but uh, that, I mean, that, you know, a lot of uh, African American, uh, especially military men, uh, servicemen ended up after the wars, ended up, whether it was the Spanish American War and going to the Philippines or um, the. Um, um, uh, World War Two and going to you know the different theaters there, or World mm -hmm. War One, excuse me, yeah. and World War Two, going two, to right. the different theaters uh, and serving. They found that they were uh, given more respect, uh, mm -hmm. not only because of their humanness, but but because of their their bravery uh, in these um, uh, uh, European and Asian countries. And mm -hmm. you're 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 right about that. And so a lot of them ended up staying. So you then you have this blending of cultures, not only in terms of daily life, but in terms of uh, lineage too. When an African African American man uh, would marry uh, a European uh, or or right. have a child marry or have a child with a European uh, uh, woman, or you know uh, blended cultures therein, and so uh, so yeah, so so you do. Matter of fact, a lot of them got different uh, European medals, the French cross, and right. uh, they, they got a lot of uh, medals because of their bravery. But then they would come home and, you know, had to uh, literally sit at the back of the bus. So right. I've defended my country um, overseas, but then I come home uh, and I've got to, uh, I've got to now defend the fact that I just defended you. And they called that uh, during World War II, they called that the double V campaign. Right. So not only do we want victory abroad against our enemies, we want victory at home against our enemies. The, the, we're going and we're fighting. We're putting our lives on the line. 
but we're also uh, coming back home. And it's it's like, uh, you know, we just celebrated the birthday of Chappie James. Right. Uh, we also had uh, James Polkenhorn, who was born the same right. year as Chappie James, 1921. And uh, he ended up passing in 1944, uh, left FAMU, as a, I think he was a rising junior, a rising senior, but ended up leaving FAMU and in uh, going to Tuskegee to be a pilot, and mm -hmm. then was uh, his his plane was lost over Italy. Right. They were coming out of uh, Northern Africa, and his uh, you know during World War II uh, again to defend America, and and his plane uh, was uh, was was lost. They were in a fight, and his plane was lost over uh, over Italy. Yeah. And uh, it is said on a clear day, you know, uh, in the winter that you can see the remains of his uh, plane. I don't know with time and, uh, you know, growth, foliage growth and things like that. But that mm. is difficult because of the terrain. It was difficult to get to. Um, mm. Wow. But yeah, so many. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so many stories yeah it just so yeah you're absolutely right there so many stories that we can tell about that you know even even about the tuskegee airmen and and their success in the war and I, and I was telling the story on radio about eleanor roosevelt and going to tuskegee and you know, folks didn't believe they were flying but so much stuff but but I'm going to let you, you, I know you had another uh, a prepared presentation you want to talk about. <laughs> so we talked about so much history that's so important that uh, I'm going to let you get at least some of that in as well. Okay, Ron? <laughs> okay. But then the other thing, speaking of Eleanor Roosevelt, I, I want to uh -huh. bring up, and I know that, you know, we're celebrating uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, Ella Jordan home and the yeah. uh, Federation of Colored Women. Women. Um, uh, uh, so we had Bethune Cookman, Mary McLeod Bethune came here. Uh, often because she was involved heavily with the Federation of Colored Women. But I also want to, you know, she she also had major stock in Central Life Insurance Company, too. Mm -hmm. And so so why it's important that, you know, that you do the social association. That's what we're going to talk about, these different associations. There was a business association, a business case for her to come here, too. So I tell people, yes, she was coming to you know, to spread the love about education and she was coming to socialize, but she's also coming to check on her money too. So <laughs> <laughs> that's me saying that, you know, <laughs> but, but she did, she had a, she had an interest, a significant interest in central life insurance company. And before it was, if you think of Joe Moore's funeral home where it is now, it was to the, if you're looking at it, it was to the right of it. So just to mm -hmm. the North of it. Now you see the building, it's an orange colored brick building. Now it's to the left of it as you, as right, you see yeah. that, that building. And Dan, I know uh, the late Dan Evans had his, uh, some of his uh, headstone things in there and it was the uh, new American press was in there for a long right. time, yeah. but they still have that. So that's their new building. It's an older building, but it's there, but that's, that's central life. Uh, insurance that's a central yeah. life insurance company yeah, yeah. yeah. so it's a I'm, I'm, you know I'm so right. you know we talk about the diversity she had diversity too absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And, and, let's, <laughs> and i just want to make it clear when you see about those uh colored women and colored women organizations yeah. they're the capital they're the ones that the reason eleanor roosevelt went to uh tuskegee because without oh. the pressure from them uh she would have probably never made that trip and so yeah. it, it was it was great robin we're gonna also have to let's make a pack here if you don't mind okay okay let's let's do at least one if we would at least once a month let's have this black matter show at least once a month starting oh, with I robin, love that. robin richard and we're going to continue black history throughout the whole year okay not we're yeah. not gonna stop it. So so let's start today and 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 we'll decide on what day of the week that we want to do or you want to do black history uh and that we can have is can, can we agree to that? I I I love that. Yes, pinky pinky swear as we say. Pinky swear. Okay. Give it <laughs> give it that where it is. Put, put it up there so I can get your finger. You can't see it, but I got you right here. See it? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, let me Pinkest see. Swear. Let me see if I can get it. Let me see if I can get the thing. Pinkest swear. Pinkest swear. There you go. Pinkest swear. Pinkest swear. We got okay. it. We got okay. it. Okay. All right. Well, go. You, go you ahead. You from Burke Corner. I'm from Natural Steps. We got it. We got it. Well, we got well, it. well, you know, I, I'm I'm from a I'm from a family in in a time that 
A man word is his bond, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we talk about, and, and people don't take, you know, they look at me very strange sometimes, uh, Robin, when even even in business, you know, people like to put everything in writing and put it in contracts. I'm thinking, well, my dad always said, that is nothing but something to use against you, something to sue you. Mm -hmm. A man, a man would, yeah, a man would have born. If I tell you I want to do something, we can handshake on or agree to it, and I'm as good, there was certain, the word is that I'm as good as my bond. And so yeah. when I go out and sell stuff, unless they insist on a contract, so we just got a gentleman's agreement. You know, yeah. if you get tired of doing what you're doing, just let me know. Then we'll just yeah. stop doing what doing. You won't need no damn contract. Yeah to do what we need to do so we got i got we just got a gentleman's and the ladies and gentlemen bond here that we're going to continue this show once a month throughout the year okay i i, I love it and thank you for that invitation because i think again just like miss uh julia martin arnold said like about kwanzaa it's a seven day celebration that should be uh a hot uh, a seven day uh uh celebration that should be observed 365 days of the year yeah, uh, and, and that's that's all of that's all of our history. Whatever history yeah. you're you're coming from, don't don't hold it close to you. You know, right. you you share it. You become you you learn like you're teaching me about the Cuban brother first in mm -hmm. uh, space. Uh, mm -hmm. So we learn, but then we also become we're students, but then we also become teachers when we dig yeah. in a little bit more. Learn, open ourselves up, not only our eyes but also our hearts to uh, to to learn to being corrected. Um, right. You know, uh, exactly. uh, about about something we know better. We we know better. We do better. As exactly. They, as they say. Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. All yeah. right. I'll let you continue. Right, I'm gonna, okay. I'm going to see if I can put up my uh, let me let me let me put my glasses on here. Hold on a second here. Okay. All right. Can you see that? I can see that. All right. Okay. So, um, all right. So, so, and we, bring, we kind of talked about bring your slide into full, 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 full stream on your slide itself. Uh oh. Uh oh. All right. Oh, let me. Oh, she got to put them glasses on now. I see. I got to put my glasses on. Hold on a second. <laughs> all right. Hold on a second. But, but go ahead. Just come, don't don't worry about. It. Don't, don't let me get you off your game. Cause we can okay. see it. We okay. can see it. Okay. Okay. So, so, you know, normally I, li I like to start here because normally, and as we've talked about that, we have, we have done, especially in Pensacola that we have done or in Escambia County that we have done this kind of, you know, city of five flags, uh, Spanish, French, British, uh, uh, Confederate and, and United States that we, that we flew up under those flags. But I, I want people to remember that that there were the first what we know as Americans. We call them Native Americans or Indians because Columbus thought or America Vespucci, whoever thought that they were in India. Uh, but but that there were people who were already here who were making their way already here. So even before what we know in Pensacola is the 1559 being the first European settlement, there were people who were already here. So it's a it's it's a debate on whether you can discover something that's already there. And so, so I want to, I want to, I want to make sure, and this is what Pensacola looked like. Uh, and remember, this is more the city of Pensacola. This is what it looked like on the earliest maps that we have in 1885. So you can see a lot of that was, uh, down at the port area. Um, and you can, you can see how it was really concentrated toward the south, southern end up in that northern part. You can see where it's more farmland and, and, and things like that. But this is what they call that bird's eye view of uh, Pensacola uh, in 1885. And uh, all the way over to the left is uh, is Belmont de Villers is all the way over here to the to the to the left. But you can see we were a port city. Uh, our main mode of transportation uh, was um, right, uh, coming in by railroad right, but by the water. I don't know whether you, you, I'm not seeing what you're seeing. I'm just looking at just a single slide uh, of troops. Uh, of the map? Of the troops. Okay. Uh -oh. I'm, just, I'm just seeing slides of the troops. On, on, okay, on so you don't see the picture. What do you see now? Just your troops. I don't see. Okay, just a, something's are not. You, are okay. you, uh, now, Let now me I'm, see. Now I'm, now I'm seeing a, uh, maybe looking like a letter. 
Yeah. Okay, so and I'm gonna gonna, I'm gonna have to do this. I'm apologize. I'm gonna have to yeah. do this then. It's not. Let me see if I can. It's for some reason. Can you match play on your power? I I, I did. Let's see here. Okay. What do you see now? Nothing but the slide. I'm seeing. I'm seeing. Um, okay. For some reason, yeah, I'm. I'm hitting it, but for some reason, it's not doing. It's not changing on your screen. It's changing on mine, but it's not changing on your screen. Okay. So that's, I just see your Kukua logo right now. Okay. Yeah. What do you see now? Uh, uh, troops standing in the field. Okay. So I'm, if you don't mind, I'm going to do it like this. I do not like to do it like this, but just in the, for, <laughs> for time's sake. Okay. Okay. So yeah, you see the are, troops. Uh, okay. American, Spanish, and French, and I guess British yes. and all those troops, yeah. right? Uh -huh. Yeah. So so these are, and I'm going to talk about them, but the 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 point here is that there are there were so many other cultures who who added to Pensacola, but we have we have you know the old moniker it was the city of five flags, but it is so many other. Uh, flags that we have flown under that, that we have, as we've been talking about, that we have not shared. And so I wanted to make sure that you knew that there were, even before the Spanish came here, there were those original Americans here. Right, right. Um, now, now that, that and, means that we had the, we had Americans and we had, you had Spanish and you had French and you had many, many other people that came here under, under that. That's right. That's, that's right. That's right. Because it was a port city. Um, right. and so, so because you saw, um, uh, let me see if I can go back to that, to that map. Okay. Uh, so you see the map here? I do. I do see the map. Okay. Let me, it's, I'm going to see if I can enlarge. Yeah. So you can, you can see where, um, here you can see where it's a, it's a, it's a port city. You can see all these ships. And so. That's where a lot of these uh, cultures came in and mix. And here you have the tan yards down here. Uh, you have the the ports down here. You see, we only have one one or one one major port now. Um, but you can mm -hmm. see all these different ports here uh, that you haven't. Even if you go over to East Pensacola, I mean, you can see all of this. So so imagine all of these different cultures coming in. Uh, mm -hmm. So so you know. So yeah. So we were you know, five flags that, that held that, that governmental banner over us. But there were so many more cultures that, that mixed in with uh, not only Native Americans, African Americans, Africans, uh, uh, the British, uh, French, Spanish, you know, so many, uh, so many other uh, cultures that mixed here. Mm. Okay. So let me... And so, so here, so the, the, this are, these are the Garfield guards and they were here at least in the 18, um, they were organized in 1881 as the Garfield guards, but they had been here, uh, even, even before this gentleman in the, uh, middle here is, we think is Isaiah Richardson, uh, captain Isaiah Richardson. Who, uh, all, all, has, of these, uh, all these are black troops here. Uh, right all in, of these are black troops. These wow. were, this was an early Florida militia based here in Pensacola. And they were, um, uh, they were, if you think of the, uh, national guard mm -hmm. or the reserve, they were the precursor to the national guard. So if you think about, uh, you know, who, again, we talk about those defending our countries. So if you think about that, these men volunteered uh, to to help. Some of them then later went and served in the Spanish American War. But they they were um, part of that uh, military guard. They were called the Butler Guards, the Pensacola Guards. But then they landed on after President Garfield uh, was shot and then uh, was assassinated. They they renamed them as a lot of troops did the Garfield Guards. And this gentleman here in the middle is Captain, what we think is Captain Isaiah Richardson. Um, and so they wrote a letter saying that they wanted to reconstitute their, uh, their, their, uh, their company and, and continue to defend Escambia County. So again, even as they weren't able to um, have equal rights you know, in society, they still saw this bigger picture and so they 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 uh, 
accompanied themselves and became the Garfield Guards. Mm. Okay. And uh, and so this is a roster from uh, 1881. And I like showing these rosters because you never know when your ancestor's name is going to show up on there, on, on here. So you see like a Samuel Cobb here. I don't mm -hmm. know if he's related to uh, Eli Cobb, E.S. Cobb Center, but it's so cool to see these names on here. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And there were there were others, too. So uh, people know. Um, Wire Park in uh, Belmont de Villers, and they also know um, the Pensacola Opera House. So this was the Edward Wire Creole Coordinate Band. They were also a military uh, band. They were part of the 3rd Battalion. And again, in the 1880s, they assembled themselves to help. So if you think of, you know, when the, when the uh, companies were marching, they had to have somebody keep time. And so these bands would be in the forefront keeping time for them. Uh, and so in the middle here, this man with the beard, that is Professor uh, Edward Wire. They called him, some of them called him Ned, but he was a, um, he was a musician. He was a, a teacher. He had a, a, um, a music shop downtown there uh, that he, uh, uh, a music school rather, not a shop, but a music school down there. That, that he did. And so they would often play for parades, uh, picnics, uh, political people coming into town, uh, military exercises, they would, they would do that. They were also called, now this is Robin's word, that they were called, I call them the house band in our modern parlance, if you will, <laughs> the house band for the opera house. So the opera house that was there until about 19... 15, 19, seven, I think it finally came down in 1917, 1918. They were the house band. So when you went to the opera house, uh, uh, right there just around the corner from uh, Seville Quarter, they have a marker there. Uh, when you went to the opera house, these were the ones who were playing. Wow. So talk about association, you know, even, even yeah. amongst when people didn't want you. And here is Here's when you see that they are playing here in 1892 at the Opera House. Mm -hmm. uh, and then here they are in 1873 uh, or uh, um, at the, uh, excuse me, it's, it, this is in 1897 saying that they were organized in 1893. Here they are in Palmetto Park, um, uh, Palmetto uh, uh, Beach, uh, Palm, mm -hmm. Palmetto Beach, which we think is over by the Warrington area. Okay. Now, they were called the Warriors 3rd Battalion Band, huh? Yep, the Wires, Wires, uh, 3rd Battalion Band, which was their military name. Now, now people know Wire, but if you think, of, who do you know by the last name of Wire today? Brian, Black, the, Brian the, Wire. The, these the, are, yes, these sir, are the his ancestors. Chamber. <laughs> yep, these are, these are his ancestors. Yep. Very good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so here, this is speaking about the military. This is, uh, um, Henry and Esmond. Esmond had just come, was part of World War II here, and this was his shop, the West Side Newsstand. So today we get our news through, uh, you know, through through uh, WBQP. We get our news through WRNE. We get our news through the newspaper, through uh, other, you know, television stations and social media. Well, you know, he had this newsstand where you could go and you could. Uh, you could uh, do your Western Union. You could bet on things, mm -hmm. baseball returns. Um, uh, you could do wires. Uh, but this was a this was a hub, and so this was uh, um, uh, uh, Henry Brown, who's the father here, and in the military uniform is his son, Esmond Brown. Now, mm -hmm. now you know his sister, Gilda Marvray. Really, that was this is Gilda Marvray's father uh, and, uh, and 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 brother. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That it's just it's just so important to to see. This is right there on DeViller Street. So this is sometime in the uh, nineteen. We think between nineteen forty five and nineteen forty seven. Hmm. Okay. And we talked about uh, uh, James Polkenhorn, but home. here's his registration card uh, uh, registering uh, for. A military service here and you can see where he was it says here at the bottom where he was a student at florida a and m uh at the time college uh fam fam c at the college and so he left um in 1942 and uh enlisted 
and the war at Eglin, and then subsequently went up to uh, Tuskegee to um, to uh, to learn to be a Tuskegee pilot. And here he is um, with the. This is him here, and here he is with his military picture here. Um, sometime between 1942 uh, uh, and 1944. Uh, well, and just as a quick pause, um, Robin, do you know? I guess you probably do know the the history of the Tuskegee Airmen and why they're at Tuskegee Institute and so forth, right? Or do you? No, I, I, I do not. I know uh, that, you know, Robert, I think Robert Moulton was the president at the at the time and really fought for, for that because his name, the field is named Moulton Field. Uh, right. But I do not know why Tuskegee was, was selected, no. Well, 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 back in the day, particularly during World War II and before World War II, that, that was a lot of pressure on uh, the government to establish uh, flying for black folks. They didn't believe that was a prevailing feeling that black folks couldn't fly, okay? And wow. people like W.E. Du Bois and um, uh, Booker T. Washington and folks like that from pressure from the civil rights organization uh, kind of forced the government, so to speak, into establishing a an aviation program at Tuskegee Institute. And I believe, wow. was, was it Booker T. Washington at the time? Was president? I don't know who was the president at the time, but they, they were well, kind of- So he died in, yeah, Booker T. Washington died in 1915, but I think it was, may have been Robert Moulton. Right. Who Mo was Moulton, first. okay, yeah, right, maybe yeah. so. I can't remember who it was, but at the time. But there was pressure into doing that, but they did it only because they wanted to set up black folks for failure. Okay, they want to oh, prove. Wow. They wanted to prove that black folks couldn't fly. Okay, and so they gave them elaborated equipment and established a program at Tuskegee Institute to just to prove the point that black folks could not fly. But obviously, it 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 all backfired on them because they found out that we could fly. And then we, even when we were flying, then they wasn't. They didn't let us participate in any significant uh, activity or send them to war or anything like that. And it, that, that was until the uh, national, uh, the, 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 the one of the black women in the national, the, the one with the four C, the four letter, uh, the National Coalition of Black Women put pressure oh, uh -huh. on. Uh, Negro put, women, yeah. Yeah, and they, they kind of put pressure on uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. And uh, that's wow. when Eleanor Roosevelt felt compelled to go to Tuskegee. And um, and she found out that she said they said that y'all can't fly. She said, but only, I want to go up with you. And she went up with. Uh, that's right. I, that's right. I, uh, I can't think of the name of the, the the particular pilot she went up with. And she flew with them, and uh, and she came back and said, y'all y'all can fly. And that would turn the tides. You know, I guess she went back and convinced her husband that you ought to start letting folks. Those black folks, uh, and that's when they send them, start sending them to Italy, and but they still, even at that, Robin, even when they got into the midst of war, they, they, you know, a lot of, you know, on the army side, a lot of them just dealt with the casualties and burying the bodies and sending, you know, preparing the body, going to the battlefield and getting them off, and they wouldn't let them particularly fight, okay, and but with the Tuskegee, I mean, it was the same thing. It was basically. They're doing a, a a lot of nothing until mm. until those those white bummer uh, 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 what you call them when you when they tried to they, they escort the bombers then they were they, escorting yeah yeah there was escorting bombers and, uh, and 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 they was dropping them like flies and uh, so they was wow. they didn't have no choice but also somebody came up with the idea okay you want to force black folks into what we're because they were dropping them like flies. that was the most dangerous job on the line mm -hmm. to try to escort those bombers and so they decided to 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 give black folks even though the white pilot, the white bombers didn't even realize at the time these pilots was black and so they sent in the, um, I can't call the name of the unit, but it was red tailed, okay? All the, all the thing the red, white pilots, yeah. all the thing the pilot knew that though they had some, they had a red signal, they had a red 
emblem on the tail. That's and right. they found That's out right. they found out that well these whatever squad these guys came out of, they are good because we are able to get through now. We had a lot less losses That's with right. these with these guys when they came back and they found out those guys happened to be black men and but but the rest is history. The the they they say more bombers and had less casualties than any of them that that flew in the history. So and they got a lot of medals from as a result of which wasn't necessary to publicize like it should. But it's a lot of history there as well. I thought I'd just throw that two cents in, Robin. Well, well, that's important because you know, I mean, so we start talking about your chicken sandwich and my gumbo, right? So if you think of, <laughs> I remember here, <laughs> hearing hearing Leah Chase talk about why gumbo was such a staple is because you took what you had, you used what you had, and you made this amazing dish with it. So it may have been the leftover from this, or it may have been a piece of this, what they say, the Holy Trinity, you know, but you took, a, <laughs> you took what you had and you made it into something amazing. I mean, absolutely amazing. Now, you know, we pay what, eight, nine, $10 for a bowl of gumbo. Right. You know? <laughs> exactly right. And, and you know, but that, but that also extends to everything else we had to do, you know, when, when, as slaves and and so forth, we wasn't allowed. Well, we wasn't allowed to have the prime part of the of the beef or the pig. We had to have leftover. We had to have whatever they threw out. We had to to make good of it. You know that's why we stuck man. We pig, pig listen in the country. We say we eat it from the rooter to the tutor. The tutor. That's exactly <laughs> right. So white folks had the steaks and the pork chops. We had the pig feet, the pig tail, the pig ears, you know, uh, stuff like that. That, but, but yeah. you know, but, but, but we made it. We made it work. And, and that's right. And, and I want to. I do want to point out. It was not all white folks that had all the the steak. There were white right. folks who were who were having challenges, just like black folks were having challenges. So it was not all of a, you know, again this diversity uh, issue. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen that movie Jones. Uh, the uh, free state of Jones, you know, where where no, these whites not. in Mississippi were saying uh, they made a, you know, they dramatized in this movie, but it's based on a free story where these whites mm -hmm. in Mississippi were saying, wait a minute, you come and you're taking my land, you're taking my assets uh, to fight in this war. But after the war, am I going to get my stuff back? Mm -hmm. So, you know, they felt like they were enriching the white uh, uh, upper class uh, uh, you know, because they say war makes money, right? So you go to war, somebody's making money in that. And so they said, you know, we want to make sure that we're getting our assets back. So there was a a revolt of sorts against uh, from whites against other whites because they wanted, you know, uh, their their land and their assets back. Uh, you know, we think of the uh, Freedom School, uh, you know, the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, yeah. Of it, but it was the it was the Bureau of Land. It was a Bureau of Land something, and which that middle part escapes me now. But the Bureau of Land and Freedmen. So it was it was in order to to act to make sure in certain areas, the forty acres and a mule. It was mainly mm -hmm. among the eastern coast of uh, South Carolina, Georgia, and northern Florida. Uh, that what they were saying, forty acres and a mule. Uh, yeah. But it was also in order to get whites back their land as as well. So when we open up this history, we see where it is not only benefiting African Americans to learn about their history; it's benefiting white Americans to learn about their history as well because they've been um, what's that word that uh, what's his name uh, use hoodwinked. <laughs> Malcolm exactly. makes it hoodwinked. You know, right. yeah. That, that we've all been hoodwinked into believing this, that that it was, you know, all or none. And it was it was not the case, you know. Robert, so, yeah. So Robert, diversity in that as well. You know, you are absolutely right. And, and poor white people, in my opinion, has really, really been hoodwinked because they have suffered the same atrocities as yes. poor black folks have done. But but it, it is not a, and, and I sometimes say, and people think I'm crazy, but sometimes I say that is really maybe not necessarily. It's about black and white, but not necessarily about black and white. It, it's a lot about the haves and the have-nots. That's okay? right. It's the, the green. And, it's, it's the, the green. green. <laughs> exactly right. And so, you, you know, not until you, you know, 
and I think Reverend Martin Luther King realized this when he he kind of phased the civil rights movement into a poor people's march. Okay, remember That's when they right. tried to organize all the poor people and soon the poor after people's that, campaign. That's poor right. Campaign, it's about economic development. Soon after that, he he got eliminated out, out of the system. So after yeah. that, it kind of went away. But because if and, and we talking about and in that he was. He was fighting for everybody. Exactly. He was fighting. He was saying he he was fighting for 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 everybody in that. He was saying poor people. He didn't say poor Asian exactly. people, poor, poor Hispanic people, right. people, poor the Alaskan people, poor Arkansan people. He was saying poor people. So if you were in that, if your economic status, he was trying to help uh, not only you do better. But he was trying to help those who were, I always say, if you talk about people who are disadvantaged, mm -hmm. then you also need to address people who are advantaged. Right. So, so, and, and how do you make sure to even that out? And I'm not talking about, you know, taking from somebody I'm saying, giving this just due uh, to, to people. And that's what, that was one of the last things that Dr. King was fighting for because human rights also mm -hmm. cover how much money goes into your human hands and, and how much stays into your human hands. Do you think that Dr. King was probably the originator of the woke movement? Because I'm telling you, and, and, and maybe oh, they no. didn't. Now, listen, no, listen, up, listen up my theory here, okay? No, I'm saying it goes back further than that. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. But what I'm saying, I think he kind of brought the attention to it because when he stopped putting the, the poor people movement together, when he started bringing all people of color, regardless of their color, but their economic stat, uh, status, and, uh, and, and, you know, I think it's the struggle between the haves and the have-nots because the haves mm -hmm. do not want to share with the have-nots. And mm -hmm. that could, and, and, and the have-nots uh, outnumber the haves by in numbers by multiple numbers of times, but the haves with the you know I guess nine or ten percent of this country, the economic wealth of this country is whole is held by uh, ten percent of the haves and 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 the have not. So I'm thinking and this is my theory now. This is Vernon mm -hmm. Watson theory that the haves could not have the have nots to wake up. And realized they were hoodwinked. Okay, so mm. we have to. In my my conspiracy theory is that they had to shut down. You, we don't have anything about the poor people movement anymore after Dr. King was assassinated, and they kind of faded away after that. And so it is uh, now that poor white people and poor other people of color and and other races began to see that. There, that the, that the halves, if you will, using that term, that, that the halves were really, bo uh, 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 what you what what at Malcolm X called it, um, hoodwink, hoodwinking us, okay, hoodwinking us, okay. Hoodwink. <laughs> Man, right. said you've been hoodwinked, bamboozled. <laughs> All right, let's get back. You know, I had to take it out well, of <laughs> Man, yeah, but I, you know, I, I think that's what that that's what we have to make sure that that we do is that you know when when it's like the Wizard of Oz, if I'm gonna do all this smoke and mirrors over here, you know, yeah. pulling that curtain back, right, and exposing that 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 thing to air and to light, you know, yeah. that's a that's a, that's a beautiful thing, and all you know, the Wizard of Oz, he wanted to make all of this fantastical thing over here because he was hurting, you know, and so that's uh, what they say: hurt people, hurt people. <laughs> and so, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So here is a here is a picture. This is again World War II era. Here is a picture uh, from the these next few pictures here from the, the what they call the colored USO right there on Davila Street. It moved around uh, Davila Street. It was on uh, one side of of the block. And it was on the other side of the block. But this was the um, uh, between nineteen forty six and forty seven. But the colored USO uh, there. Okay. And so this was a place where they could go, uh, African-American men and women uh, who were uh, dealing with the service could go and have a respite from not only the service, but, uh, you know, to, and, and to recreate and to have a, a kind of a break, you know. So whether they were uh, here stationed here or whether they were just traveling through, uh, the USO offered this place uh, where that they could gather and recreate and uh, have a respite from military uh, mm -hmm. duty and, you know, just kind of be themselves. And as you can see, these are young men and women. Um, I don't know if all of the, the women, since they're in civilian clothes, if they were 
uh, related to the service or if they were just coming there to to recreate uh, as as well because we know that there were we had the wax and the waves the mm. women auxiliary uh, uh, service organizations that served right along with the with the with the men and so here are some of those pictures again of them uh, having uh, uh, and recreating in that and they call it sometimes travelers aid service so this is from 1946 1947 okay and then you had people like here. Um, you had people uh, um, who were coming together for uh, to to we talk about that money, right? So here yeah. is uh, <laughs> um, the un Union Grocery Company coming together. They were opening up, a, I think it was a second or a third store, uh, and they were coming. They were having a meeting at Allen Chapel, uh, but they were they were coming together. Uh, and here are some early uh, pictures. Again, these are Belmont de Villas, but this is what we don't see in our history. Yeah. You know, the West Hill taxi stand, uh, the uh, people call this uh, lady here, Effie Harvey. Uh, they called her the Lady Barber. Um, the uh, Sabre Social Club here, the, the Kappa uh, men here. And so this is what you didn't, what we typically don't see when we talk about Pensacola history. Right. So here's an early picture of Joe Moore's uh, funeral home around 1938. Um, and, uh, so you can see, it's really cool where you can see they got those fine cars out there, uh, uh, which is really cool. So I'm going to move this, this here, but you can see here, this picture here, this is that early picture I was talking about of the central life insurance company. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Hey, yeah. uh, hey, Robin, is that, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there looking at the picture and I know, uh, David is still in that same original building, but you know what is the I didn't realize it had a had a, a second floor. Yeah, so this was yeah, you know how buildings change over time. Originally yeah. it was a house. I think I do have a picture of the original mm -hmm. house that that was attached to it. Uh and it's still there. Um but yeah, yeah. So in in this amazing, you know, Bimbo's had a second floor as well. Yeah. Okay. Bimbo's had a second floor. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Just over, over, over time, you know, but here they have this beautiful picture of, of, of them with their, with those fine automobiles right there. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And okay. there was also a uh, Morris brothers. They also own where Reverend Powell's building is now. Uh -huh. There was a, Mo a, a Morris brothers uh, store. We're still trying to confirm that it was associated with the, the Morris brothers who, uh, and the, the mate, the patriarch, Richard Morris actually came over from the Caribbean and he was one of the uh, lighthouse keepers out at the naval uh, base there. Well, Robin, is it true that actually the building that Reverend Powell is, the Old Smith's Bakery, wasn't that originally owned by a black person that had a shop there and then the folks out of Mobile came and bought that building, uh, Smith Bakery? It, 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 that's a story so, behind so that as not, well, right? Yeah, so not that building, but it was a bakery on his on that property, property that was owned right. by a black man named Robert Bennett. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then uh, Robert Bennett had his bakery at least as early as 1900, maybe 1890, but at least as early as 1900. He had the Vienna Bakery mm -hmm. downtown, and then he opened up Bennett's Bakery. And I think I have a, a listing of him an ad that he did in 1911. Um, but he came from New Orleans. Him and his wife uh, Allie. Uh, had the the bakery shop, and then in the sometime in the twenties, a white brother named uh, Joseph Reed ended up uh, building the building that we see today. Uh, okay. And then uh, uh, Gordon Smith came from Mobile and opened up. He had always wanted to open a shop in a bakery in Pensacola, mm. and so he bought that in uh, from uh, from. Uh, Joseph Reed in 1924. Okay, but yeah, originally that that was Robert Bennett, who was a black man, R. L. Bennett, and his wife Ali uh, owned uh, the bakery that that was there. Not that building, but the bakery. That's right. Okay, now looking at this picture here, so the Mars brothers. I'm assuming one of Joe's brothers. They had a they they opened up a a uh, an, a store that looked like a, a dry goods store, huh? Yeah, yeah. So they had a number of businesses, um, uh, at, at least three businesses, and 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 maybe maybe more, but at least three businesses that they that they had. They were entrepreneurs. 
I, I had the opportunity to uh, interview uh, the only, the oldest living grandchild, the only living grandchild, uh, Mr. Prince Morris, who's in his 80s. And he said, he said the, the thing, he said a lot of people didn't know is it was the women who were financially backing the Morris brothers' businesses. Yeah. The women generally were teachers. And so they had this steady income and it was the women who were backing, who were the financial backers of their businesses. Wow. So you may have seen Morris brothers, but it was the, it was the Morris sisters who were financing <laughs> the, the business. <laughs> well, yeah. that, you know, that yeah. makes perfect sense, you know? Absolutely. Ab mm. Absolutely. Polly Morris. And, uh, there were, there were several sisters who were, who were sisters and wives who were, you know, who were public school teachers. And so you think mm. a public school teacher, you're going to get paid every, you know, whatever, every month, every, every two weeks or whatever, you're going to have that, that steady they, they used, paycheck. Teachers used to get paid. What, unless they change it, they, they, it was up until recently, they were still getting a monthly check, right? Monthly check. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> think, Guaranteed, that, right? Has, has that changed? Has, has that, that changed? Teachers I, used I'm, to get paid I'm not sure if that's changed or not. I'm not sure if that's changed yeah, or not. Me yeah. yeah. Okay. Continue. Yeah. Okay. We only got we only got about uh, ten more minutes here, so okay. All right. It, well, I'll I'll, I'll I'll go through these. And I talked about that uh, the the real estate here is uh, the the Union Mercantile and Real Estate Association was a group of African American men and women that started at least as early as the 1880s, and they sold. Uh, bought and sold land to black folks so mm -hmm. that they could build uh, their own when 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 black folks were not getting the land or the buildings that they wanted they they ended up forming this organization that was there from the 1880s at least until 1938 is the last that we see them but they are buying and sold and here you see in one case where they bought one for two hundred dollars turned right around and sold it for 250 so yeah. you know $50 I, in 1900, you know, that's a nice penny. I want um, you to, hey, I, I want you to note that the Daily News on August 4th, 1900 reported that Thomas C. Watson <laughs> and his wife. Hey. hey <laughs> no, the union yeah, so that, Thomas <laughs> Watson, he, he bought and sold a lot. So I don't know. I think he was white. Uh, but, you know, listen, there's only one earth. So we all can somehow, right? Yeah, <laughs> we, we wouldn't have so many light skinned black folks if we wouldn't can. Well, well, listen, we all can somehow. That's 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 right. Okay. And and here is you know we talk about Kareem Jones, Kareem Jones yeah. Center. This is her father, uh, Wade Harvey, and her uncle, uh, J M Harvey, uh, who started another association, the Draymond's Joint Stock Company. And Draymond were people who um, uh, who who drove some sort of uh, truck. Uh, so we think of them now as like uh, truck drivers and, you know, long haul drivers, but they drove some sort of uh, truck, which in the, at the time could have been a, um, you know, a wagon, uh, but they drove some sort of truck, but they associated themselves as a Draymond's Association and did a joint stock company so that they can, again, um, um, make sure that they, uh, uh, for the benefit of the stockholders. And so they had uh, five thousand, uh, five thousand uh, dollar capital stock, and divided into five hundred shares of ten dollars each, and so it was so that they could come together and buy things uh, for right. for for themselves. Yeah, okay. That, that coming good. together. Wade Harvey is uh, what what we consider the um, uh, between Wade Harvey and uh, uh, and then Goldstucker, uh, but Wade Harvey is considered the father of uh, the African American funeral homes here, and this is mm. Kareem Jones's father. Okay, very good. That was circular nineteen oh four, huh? Yeah, that was. Uh, well, he was he was there for for much longer. Uh, but then, yeah, yeah. then the uh, um, uh, yes, that, that's right. That's right. Uh, hey, hey, Robin. As a, as a matter of a little bit of history, I want you to notice the phone number there. Two oh nine. Three three digit numbers. <laughs> that's all, all you need is three digits. That's all. That's all it was. No, no. What they say, him locked something when they went to the seven yeah. digits. No, just three. And yeah. this is in the Florida Sentinel, which was black yeah. owned by I mentioned earlier uh, Matthew Louis, who was a uh, Civil War veteran, mm -hmm. uh, lawyer, uh, teacher. He was mayor of Noonansville. Um, and so he was uh, looking for an opportunity. And so he bought the Florida Sentinel 
reconstituted the paper as a statewide African American newspaper. Okay. And so here, uh, we'll, we'll close down with some of these last ones here. This is really cool. We talk about John Sunday. We have this because John Sunday filed a lawsuit. And so these, these papers were put into the, um, into the uh, courthouse, the court records, but this was the People's Building Cooperative, the People's Cooperative Building and Loan Association, which was an early, we think of Navy Federal, it was an early credit union. So it was started in 1891. And uh, we know that it was at least there until 1897 and perhaps even longer, but it was registered with the state of Florida. It was registered with the federal government as a uh, financial institution. And so what you would do is you would pay 50 cents to join. Let me see if I can get this back here. I thought I had the thing. You would pay 50 cents to join. Oh, there it is. A 50 cent initiation fee. Uh, right now, I think you pay, what, $25 to join a credit union? Yeah. And then uh, then you would pay 25 cents a week and, and to order to be a member of this early credit union. And then they would take that money and they would loan that money out to African-Americans so that they could buy houses with a six year mortgage so wow. that they could uh, uh, build uh, their businesses so they could build buildings for their business. And so they could save. And so here is this early stock certificate that was transferred uh, from uh, uh, Stokes to John Sunday. So we have this because uh, John Sunday ended up filing a lawsuit because they were not meeting. So uh, he had to provide this some documentation to the uh, court of records. And so we have this uh, because he provided that, the, this documentation to the court of records. Okay. And we don't see another bank here. There was another bank that was tried to be started here by a gentleman named William Jones, who was out of New York. He had started one in Mobile. Um, and so uh, in 1911, he came to uh, uh, Pensacola and tried to start one here where he said the people of Escambia County, I hope the people of Pensacola and Escambia County will get ready for a Negro bank because it is coming. Yeah. And we don't see any, um, any effort that it was coming, that it did come. Um, but I think it's important here. The second paragraph says, colored people of Escambia County arise awake. The battle is on. We must have a bank. Therefore talk bank, dream of bank and work for bank for bank. We must have. And so he was, um, really doing this, uh, you know, this compelling, uh, attitude that black folks needed to band together to have this bank so that they could just like the earlier bank so that they could save so that they could um, uh, invest so that they could uh, build their livelihoods, whether it was through a house or through uh, a, a business. It's interesting that you say that, you know, uh, Robin, is that 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 was in that was printed in the Pensacola News Journal back in 19, what, 11 or something like that? 1911. Uh, that's right. right. October 20th, 1911. And and this guy was out of Mobile, right? I want you to know he was out of New York, but he had started York. one in one Mobile. In Mobile. Yes. You, do, yeah. But do you know that Mobiles to this day do have a black bank in Pennsylvania? Well, do not. But okay, that, that's right. And Sidney King with Commonwealth, the president, will be at our next Pensacola Network. Really, uh, very good. February twenty fourth. That's right. That's right. He will. He will be there. So I'll talk with you about that offline, but yeah. he will, he will yeah. be here. Yeah. Sydney, yeah. Sydney King. It was started by a husband and wife team uh, mm -hmm. who still, uh, they call him the general who is still associated with the bank. But uh, yeah, it has been around for 30 plus years, I believe. Right. Almost yeah. as long as you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Almost as long as W. Yeah. But they still have a, they still have a bank there. Exactly well, right. Well, very good, very good. Okay, right. Con all right. Continue. We only got about three minutes. Okay, all right. Well, and this is a picture of uh, uh, the National Negro Business League. This was like the culmination of all of these smaller associations. They all came together in Boston in 1900. And there are two gentlemen, Matthew Louis is shown here, and uh, Daniel Cunningham from Pensacola is shown here. And here is Booker T. Washington right here. And mm -hmm. so. So you saw Pensacola's influence in uh, that national conversation and uh, the national economy, not only of black folks, but of the whole of America. 
uh, because you saw these folks coming together. And I'll just kind of slide through some of these other. You have Sam real, Charles real, Schuster. Real, real, real quickly, I wonder if that National Negro Business League was the forerunner of the uh, current, um, what's his name, with the, with the current black national uh, business. What's his name? Uh, come on, help me now, John Gray. Come on, Robin, help me out. Oh, oh, uh, uh, um, uh, with Black Enterprise. No, yeah, Black Enterprise. Um, but the, the they got an organization, a national organization, still run today. Uh, that featured. Hmm. Uh, come on now, because you know. So, um, so, oh, oh, out of, so yeah. So out business. of this came the national, the Publishers Association came out of this. The Black okay. Journalists Association okay. came out of this. Yeah. Mm, okay. All right. D did uh, not did Earl, Earl Earl Graves. You thinking yeah, of Earl Graves? Yeah. Earl, well, that was Black Enterprise. Earl Graves. But I'm talking about it's a it's an organization that's running even today, a national <coughs> Black business organization. The business uh -huh. league. What it is? What it's called now? The the um. It's a well-respected black business organization that ran, still running today. I was wondering, it was that the National Negro Business League was the forerunner of that <laughs> particular operation. Uh, uh, but it'll come to me, uh, Robin. But continue before we run out of time. Yeah, I'm not sure they were. They were out. He did this out of uh, Tuskegee, and each year they did yeah. that Negro in Business book. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm not sure. But here is uh, this is the 17th meeting. So sometime around in 1917. But Sam Charles. Uh, spoke there okay. about his shoe business and here you see him advertising in 1919 and showing the inside of his shoe parlor downtown on Palafox Street. Wow, wow. Robin, we're going to have to we're going to have to cut it off. But okay, all right. For, for today, but we're going to continue our monthly black history show going forth, okay? So you can pick it up from there or you can have a whole new show, whatever you want to do. And uh, we'll let folks know when the time, what, what time we decide on and when we're going to do it. But we are going to have it every, at least once a month. We can have it more often okay. if you want to, but at least once a month, uh, a Black History program uh, so that folks will know our history. And I'm going to do my part to make sure that they do know it, Robin. And I, okay. and I, really and, and I think I think it would be great to take even like a topic because like, just like mm -hmm. you're in the media, you know, so we can even mm -hmm. do and expand that topic, that topic out. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Now, listen, thank you very much for taking your time out. Uh, mm -hmm. We took we took two hours of time. It was started off as a 30 minute show. But, <laughs> but you know, when you and I get together, we can't talk for no 30 minutes. And we're well, talking about history, talking about stuff that we love. And mm -hmm. uh, so but. I think people that will see this show are going to be greatly enhanced by it and, and enhanced by your knowledge. And I want to thank you again for coming on to the show today, okay? And I'm going well, to you, you give you the thank last you for the platform. All right, and give you the last word. You got, it, you got some final words that you want to pass Ooh. on? <clears throat> Listen, I always say more important than where you sit is how you stand. More important than where you sit is how you stand. So if you you have a particular platform, a seat or whatever, how do you stand in those times when, when you are needed? And so, so, so we want to make sure that people stand up for history, for everybody's history. And so, so forget which chair you sit in, whether it's the governor's chair, the sheriff's chair, the, the, the TV owner's chair, uh, or, or if you barely got a stool, how do you stand for other people? And right. that's what black history is about. That's what our history is about is standing so that other people can share, making sure as you talked about those griots can continue to share that, that, that lore so that in seven generations and 107 generations, our stories will continue to be told. So thank you for this platform, Vernon Watson. I really do appreciate it. All right, Robin Jean, thank you. We'll see you on another edition of Black History Matters, okay? Thanks. Thanks, Pensacola. Don't know, don't really